Support for this program comes from Jazz on the Tube, the Internet's largest collection of free streamable classic jazz videos from Miles Davis to Louis Armstrong, from Thelonious Monk to Duke Ellington. You'll find it all on jazzonthetube.com. Start your free subscription today. Hi, and welcome to Jazz Talk, a Jazz on the Tube podcast. My name is Ken McCarthy, and this is where we talk with people who are doing important work that supports and illuminates the music we love. The writers, the scholars, the educators, the filmmakers, the producers, and more. Today, we're going to be talking about a beautiful film and a beautiful musician who deserves a whole lot more attention. And amazingly, this film was made in 1994, and there's a famous physicist, I wish I could think of his name, and he said, time is nature's way of keeping everything from happening all at once. So uh-huh. <laughs> in, in a way, I'm like, how could I have not known about this film until now? But time is nature's way of keeping everything from happening all at once. So without any further ado, the name of the film is Forgotten Tenor, and it's about the, the life and art of the beautiful, I'm going to use that word a lot, I guess, Wardell Gray. If you're not familiar with Wardell's music, this is going to be a big thing for you to discover it. If you are familiar with it, this is a, I guess I'm using this word a lot, this is going to be a beautiful, this is a beautiful tribute to an artist, from one artist Mm -hmm. to another. Our guest today is Abraham Rivette. He is a professor of film and photography at Hampshire College in Amherst, Massachusetts. Welcome, Abraham. Thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. I was going to say when you introduced me that the film really is a a tribute. That's what it is. So I'm glad that you included that in your introduction. Yeah, it's not an ABC paint-by-numbers documentary. It's a tribute. It's a love letter. It's a meditation. It's a deep film. And maybe we'll start by talking about the film aspect of it. And then we're going to talk about Wardell Gray and, and his work. You know, there's a sort of You know, every art form has conventions, and some art forms are more flexible than others. For instance, music, you know, makes room for all kinds of expression. And strangely enough, film and video and TV and all those things, you know, the flickering screen, is actually pretty – the conventions are pretty tyrannical, (laughs) you know. There's there's like one – you know, there's one right way to tell a story on film. Now, you – you're one of the filmmakers that said, hey, you know what? I'm not going to do a Hollywood-style film-slash-documentary. I'm going to you know, express this outside that, those strict conventions. So I'm going to give my experience to, to viewers. When you get this film, I'm going to just be frank. Give it some time. It is not the normal ABC paint-by-numbers thing. And what you're going to find is there's a rhythm to this, and some beautiful things happen when you stick with it. I mean, some really profound things. And it's a huge challenge to, to do a film that does an artist like Wardell Gray justice. You know, how do you do it? How do you, how do you, how do you like, do the guy justice? You know? So maybe we could talk about that, how you came to make the film, how you had the courage, because all art has to start with courage. And how did you have the courage to attempt to do this great, profound artist justice in the film medium? That's a lot of questions there, Ken. (laughs) Uh, Let me start off first by saying that the film was finished in 1994, and since that time, or even before that time and to this day, I'm still interested in the evolution of nonfiction practice, meaning how does this form of filmmaking, and I use filmmaking both in analog and digital technologies, how has that form evolved? How is it constructed? And in the process of gathering the materials for this film, first of all, I didn't have a preconceived script. So I started off, let me back up for a second, I didn't really know about Wardell Gray till one day here in Amherst, Mass, at a local radio station, for some peculiar reason, 
a guy who usually has a classical music program named John Montanari was substituting for another person and played like an hour and a half segment tribute to Wardell Gray. I never heard of him. I mean, I was knowledgeable about the music in some respects, but I was so profoundly taken in by the music that I was curious who this person was. How come I never heard of him wherever I was in my life? So I began to explore that. And I began to explore it within the context of the medium that I work in, which is at that time film, 16 millimeter analog film, not digital technology. Mm. So I had to begin somewhere. I mean, I did some research. I had to begin somewhere. And I found out that there was something called the Snader Telescriptions. These were early sort of soundies. These were short films that were made and played in these kind of apparatuses where people put money into them and watched these short segments. They were the precursors in many ways to our music videos. And there was a couple of Snader telescriptions. These are motion picture films with the Count Basie septet and sextet or septet, I'm not sure. And so I tried to figure out where can I find this material on film? And there was a guy through a circuitous route, there was a collector in New York City, I forget his name at the moment, that had this material. I went to see him, and he lent me these 16-millimeter films and allowed me to take them to a motion picture lab and make copies of them so that I can view them and potentially use this material. With, one of them is with Helen Yoon singing, I Cry For You. Mm-hmm. So I really began the film by trying to find out if any of the people who played on that date with the Count Basie group were still alive. Uh-huh. So I started finding out who the, if these people were still alive. And that's how I, I began the journey. But basically, I was interested in finding out a little bit more about Wardell Gray and the people who played with him. And I knew all along that the only way I could construct this film was based on material that I gathered and then tried to figure out a structure and a form for the work in the editing process. And when I say editing process for your viewers, I'm talking about 16 millimeter film edited on a flatbed editing machine, okay? Mm -hmm. So I went around and I literally was a one person crew. I didn't have, I lugged the 16 millimeter camera and this uh, Nagra tape recorder and located the various people that you see in the film. You know, I located Jimmy Lewis, I located Gus Johnson in Colorado. I located Buddy DeFranco in Panama City, Florida. I located Clark Terry as he was on a gig in upstate New York somewhere. I located Teddy Edwards. And, you know, I just kept locating. And then also Wardell's immediate family. He had two wives who were still alive. Both of them lived in Los Angeles. And he had a daughter from another marriage who was living in Lansing, Michigan. So I just, I did this journey. I had a lot of more energy at that time. We're talking about now more than 25 years ago that mm-hmm. I could lug this equipment, you know, and literally short of Los Angeles, where I had a former student help me out with the cinematography, I just did it all. I just set up the camera. Mm. I set up the light. I, I wow. just did it all by myself. I. It's, it's, wow. not, it's not an unusual tradition, but we're not talking about crews here. We're talking about me just going. Now, all of this, by the way, is before, if I'm not mistaken, email exchanges. If I'm not mistaken. Oh, yeah. Let me say, no, I, no, it, so, it would have been a rare, rare civilian who had email right. in, in 1994. Yeah. So, yeah, so I had to make contact with people through mail, through telephone. So there was a lot of kind of investigation, journalism, interactions, and I had a lot of help along the way. I couldn't do this on my own. You know, through magazines, I found out people who knew Wardell's family, who knew this person, who knew that person. But basically, I just went there, and with every individual, I worked differently, meaning that 
I had a set of questions that I wanted to ask. Some of them, I gave them the questions ahead of time. Others, it was extemporaneously right there on the spot. So what you witness on the film really is also an exchange of individuals, how they resonated with me, this guy who's coming from, you know, Western Mass, who wants to make a film about someone that they cared a lot about. You know, all of them really cared a lot about Wardell. And I didn't want to exaggerate his, you know, how he died and the circumstances of how he died and the drug use. I, I just wanted to kind of really talk about the intimacy of his life with these people and him as a musician. Mm. So that's what motivated me. And, and I think the larger question maybe we can get to later, which you speak about, is the form and the structure of this work. You know, I don't think it's that unusual necessarily. I was interested and have always been interested and continue to be interested primarily, number one, in what Bill Nichols calls a writer theoretician about nonfiction practice, what he calls the reflexive mode of representation. And by that I mean is that I always wanted in the film itself to acknowledge my subjectivity, my presence, mm -hmm. Right, the act of constructing the work. I didn't want to create this illusion that there's no camera there. So reflexivity became really a primary interest of mine in, throughout ma many of my films and really shaped the work in many ways as well. The other one was since I was working primarily in analog, I have to use that term, in 16 millimeter film, the material is not always just straight that comes out of the camera. As a filmmaker or as a worker in any kind of medium, you have apparatuses that allow you to work with the image, with rhythm, pacing, tone. So I worked also with what's called an optical printer. This is a tool that for many years before the digital world, that all the special effects in the industry were made with this tool, that you can re-photograph every frame or parts of a frame in any possible combination. So some of the things that you see in the film were re-photographed and re-presented beyond the 24 frames per second traditional flow of a projected image. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I guess what I'm saying in, in summary is that I'm really interested in the form, in the structure of the work in tandem with the themes that are being presented. And that's what, you know, when you sort of responded to the film itself, that it takes time to unfold and it's not necessarily a traditional expository work that envelops most of our viewing on television. Exactly. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it, I think it's good preparation when, when people get this film. And yeah, you, it's cool. It's like, I think in theater, what do they call it? The fourth wall? Yeah. Yeah. That's it, right. it, you, you actually see the film being made as well as watching the film, as well as learning about Wardell and, and experiencing Wardell through the people that loved him. And, That's right. you know, this is good. And that, and that the filmmaking process is not just seamless. Things just don't happen because you decide you want to make a film or because you decide you want to talk to somebody. They're not necessarily just going to respond accordingly. I wanted to show those, those starts and stops, you know, those inconsistencies in every creative endeavor. So that you'll witness in the film as well. Yeah, I like that. The, yeah, the starts and the stops, there, there's rhythm to the film. It's not a continuous flow. It, it's, it ebbs and flows and stops and starts and goes back on itself and then returns. It's, it's, it's cool. I, I really enjoyed it. And, you know, in the future, and, and actually the future is here to a certain degree, but it will be even more so, <laughs> let's say 50 years from now, the only way people are really going to know Wardell, the human being, is going to be through this film because you took the time to go out and talk with the people that knew him best and loved him the most. And mm -hmm. if you hadn't done this, Wardell, we would, we would only have the film. Not, not, when I say the film, I don't mean your film, but I mean the footage that exists of him, and we'd have some narrative, but we wouldn't know anything about the guy. You know? 
And, you know, we, and then unfortunately that's the case for so many musicians. You know, we don't know what Vic Spiderbeck was like, or there's, mm -hmm. there's, there's, we could list hundreds of musicians. We'll just never know. We're kind of in the, almost in the same realm as Mozart. You know, what was Mozart like? Who knows really? But thanks to this film, we'll really have a sense of, of the human being. But so also, let's, let's, if I may yeah. add, Ken, if I may add, not just Wardell, but the people who happen to be still alive who were inspired by him, who loved him, who cared about him, what their presence is like also in the early 1990s, years after Wardell's passing. So I was interested in that also. You know, I have to share, if I may, one quick anecdote with you. Please. The Sineda Telescriptions of the Count Basie Septet there are, I think, three or four of them with Wardell in them, and I think I only chose two to work with. I showed them Archie Shep was working here at UMass at the time, and I wanted to talk to him about Wardell, thinking, you know, that he might have known him maybe. Or, so I invited him up to a screening room, and I projected the – Snader telescriptions for him. These are short, like I said, short films. And I projected one of them, the one with Helen Humes, and it's about, I don't know, three or four minutes, and he asked me, can you show it again? Mm. So I projected it again. When I say projected, I'm talking about it as a 16 minute right. film, <laughs> not as a digital end. And I right. did it again. And he said, can you do it again? So he, mm. he, met, he kept asking me to project this, and then he said, you know, what a great influence Wardell was for him. He just loved looking at him again, you know, at that time period, because mm. he was very inspired by his playing and his music. So even though I didn't have Archie in the film, I would say the people that I did have, you know, really, really were affected by him in profound ways. And one of them that I didn't mention was Art Farmer. You know, mm. I was able to talk to Art Farmer after one of his performances in Boston. So, you know, I went down to Boston and he was extremely, extremely kind to me. You know, like he was like, he couldn't believe actually maybe that somebody was interested to make this happen. And with him, you know, it was, he was living in Vienna at the time. All this had to be done through mail, you know, regular mail, air mail letters to make the yeah. appointments. But he was, you know, really, and, and you could see it in the film as well what an impact Wardell had on him, on his being and his life and his music. And I think he, in many ways, wanted to use this opportunity to pay tribute to him, you know, to kind of grief maybe a loss after all these years. So it, I think that the opportunity to talk about it also had something important for the people that I spoke to, not just me as a filmmaker. This is the kind of retrospective thinking I have now as I talk to you. I never really thought about that before. You know, well, it, clock you know it's, it, it, it's, pardon me, it, it's, it's interesting too. I've never thought about this before, but of all the art forms, musicians may be the closest to each other. You know, maybe actors might share that closeness too. Yes. Um, but, but, you know, for instance, filmmakers, you know, you guys are off making your films and you're not really, you know, you know each other and you might hang out a bit. But when you're working, you're working separately. And sculptors, painters, you know, it's not a communal art form. That's right. Where music so, is. People, so you're spending they, days, weeks, years on the road very intimately with your fellow artists. So it, the impact and, and, of course, the production of the art depends on sensitivity to right. the people you're working with. So. Mm -hmm. The depth of connection between musicians is something pretty deep, actually, when you think about it. I'm sure it is. I mean, as an amateur and aspiring musician, I haven't played with anybody yet. So I, I, I take what you say as important information and knowledge. But, you know, it's like all the people that I spoke to, not just his fellow musicians, but his friends, people who knew him. I, I really now, you know, it's amazing. I'm talking to you now. I'm really thinking about it that that the film really provided them an opportunity maybe to deal with their grief again. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, I, I didn't think about that. I'm just kind of ruminating on this at the moment. And in many ways, it's yeah. visible. It's visible in terms of like, you know, Clark Terry, 
when I spoke to him, I'm not dropping names here, by the way. These are people in the film, right? Right, so right, when of I course. Spoke, right, when I spoke to him, and once again, he was also really kind and nice. Now, this is a big deal I'm talking about. Not everybody is forthcoming or they want to talk to you just because I want to make a film. They don't open the doors for me just like that, right? So I really mm -hmm. feel many of the people were extremely kind in terms of their receptivity to me and my project. But Clark, I mean, you could tell how much of a lament there was and disappointment in his voice and his ruminations and reflect, reflections on the prize when he found out, you know, that Wardell was, quote, using drugs. Yeah. So, you know, I guess these are kind of, these are sort of the unsaid, the nonverbal components that many of us absorb and witness when we watch a moving picture that's not just about the words. Mm. Hey, let's talk a little bit about Wardell the artist. Yeah. Uh, I imagine that you accumulated a fair amount of bio biographical information about him. Where was he from? Some. And some? By the I'm way, you know, there's, there's a guy in, in England, in London, who has been working on a biography of him for decades. He still hasn't finished it. And he was uh -huh. very helpful to me in terms of, you know, photographs that he let me use. So I'm waiting. I, I don't know if it'll ever come out, but there is a guy that's been writing a biography for decades, literally decades. Mm. Now, I don't know what's holding him back from finishing it, but people who are interested, maybe it'll come out in the next couple of years or so. I'll let him know that we had this conversation. Maybe that will spur him on. <laughs> well, thousands of people will be listening to this. Yeah. So yeah. This, this, this. Maybe he will, too. Maybe he will, too. I hope he does. And I... Yeah. You know, it's it's hard to be an artist in any medium, and, you know, we want to encourage him to keep marching forward and, and bring this yeah. beautiful thing to us so we can yeah. see it, because yeah. Wardell clearly merits a lot more um, attention and profile. You know, unfortunately, you know, jazz is part of show business, and part of show business is promotion, and, you know, if somebody's not being promoted, even if it's a past artist, the, the market doesn't, you know, the new people coming in who are learn interested in learning about the art form may never hear yeah. of him or, yeah, or may only hear right. just his name but not understand his significance. That's so right. What can you tell us about Wardell's life, you know, where, where he was born and what year or what relative period of time? You know, I'm not an authority, you know, at all. I know that he was a precocious musician at some point. I mean, he lived in Detroit, played in that area. He still has family, I believe, in, in Lansing. I think his daughter is still there. I think he started playing around at an early age and worked with different bands and got recognized fairly quickly. From what I understand, he, you know, he was always on the road based on what his, both of his wives, Dorothy Gray and Jerry Gray, revealed to me, told to me. He was very, very smart and well-read individual who kept up on, on things that were going on in the world. And he had a lot of tensions, I think, about always being on the road, being a freelancer, and the impact that had on his personal life. It, it wasn't easy, basically. So, you know, I, I don't know many more factors about him. I just had experiences with people who were connected to him and whose lives were affected by his personality and the way he conducted his life as a freelance traveling musician. You know, you're always going somewhere, right? You're always on somewhere. You know, you have to move constantly. That certainly has an impact on your personal life. And that comes through, that came through very clearly in the, in the film. You actually have someone narrating letters written by Wardell about being that's on right. the road and, that's his and wife. the longing, that's his, the longing that's to be home. Wife. Yeah, that's his wife. Right. That's, that's his, his wife. wife. That's his wife. Okay. Yeah, and this is one know, of this, his wife. <laughs> one. This this goes back to the the showbiz aspect of of jazz, and you know we're we're all fans, and we go and we hear we we go out. Someone's coming through town, and we go and hear them play. And most people have jobs that keep them at home. You know, you get in the car and you drive to work, and you drive home, and yeah, it's it's a drag. You know, work is a drag in some ways, but you're home every night. But to be a successful jazz musician, 
in the showbiz sense, in other words, to have your name known, to have your records, your CDs made and promoted, you must be on the road. You, it's not That's an option. Right. If, if you're not on the road, you don't exist. Right. So not everybody's cut out. I mean, some people listening to this call may have had jobs where they had to do business travel, and I've had yeah. to do a lot of business travel, and it's misery. <laughs> you know? It's absolute misery. And to be on the road for months at a time, away from home for months at a time, very tough. So this is one of the sacrifices that the musicians in this field make to be in the art. So I have a few little things about Wardell I could just share with people. He was born in, like so many great jazz musicians, this is kind of a, this might be a surprise to some of our listeners, he was born in the Southwest. And by the Southwest, I'm talking about, in his case, Oklahoma, specifically Oklahoma City. He was born in 21, and his family moved there when he was, he moved to Detroit when he was eight. So he had his formative years in that incredibly creative, it's, people don't generally think of Oklahoma as being a, a creative music hotbed, but believe me, it was. I mean, for one thing, Don Cherry was born in, in, in Oklahoma City, and there's many, many more. They might even be roughly different ages. Yeah, Don Cherry would have been younger. So Detroit was a huge hotbed of great music. And so he, there he was in Detroit, right in the middle of it. And other people that came out of Detroit were Donald Byrd, Lucky Thompson, Al McKibben, the bassist. And they, and they actually not only came out of Detroit, they specifically came out of the high school that he went yeah. to. And, and Abraham, one of the things I'm, I'm always interested in, in when talking about jazz is the, in, the educational infrastructure because it's not uncommon for you to see three or four or five or ten or more great musicians coming out of a specific high school in a specific city. The, probably the most famous one is one in Chicago, DuSable. And there was a man named Captain Diet. And the list of musicians who were trained by him is, is mind-boggling. You can hardly believe your eyes and ears that they all could have gone through the same training. So it looks like Wardell received... There must have been somebody at Cass Technical High School. Yeah. <laughs> there must have Cass, been one hell right, of a Cass. music teacher. Yeah. I think so, Yosef Latif also was there. Who was there too? Yosef Latif. Oh, yeah, in Detroit. Yeah, many, many yeah. great musicians came out of Detroit. But in this case, these three, uh, four, including Wardell, Donald Byrd is a giant, Lucky Thompson, a giant, Al McKibben, these are giants of the music. There must have been an amazing music teacher at Cass Technical High School. So just want to throw that out there. And, yeah. and with that kind of a training, he would have been a professional very early. You know, he would have graduated yeah. from high school and he would have been band ready, you know. Uh huh. So cool. And then one of the first people to give him his, his big break was Earl Father Hines, the, the great yeah. pianist and orchestra leader. So that's, a, that's, that's Wardell's background. And then lots of travel, as is required if you want to be in the business every profession has its requirements. If you want to be a doctor, you got to spend, you know, a decade you know, going through misery of school. If you, you know, and if you want to be a jazz musician and you want to be known, you got to be on the road. So tell us about his, his impact. And then I guess what you would be talking about is the impact on particular musicians, but he, could we, would we say that he's in the bebop school? I'm going to let that, I'm going to leave that to you to, to make that, to make that response. I mean, I, it depends on your definition of the bebop school. Some people would call him that. I mean, I think people would place him in different kinds of categories. He certainly was able to play across all kinds of ways, don't you think? Right? You, you know, yeah, and that brings up the whole topic of labels, you know, bebop, right? swing, how real are these categories? Well, there's he sort played of with Benny Goodman. He played, he played with Benny exactly. Goodman. You know, many good men yep. wanted him, you know, yep. so at the time, you know, I, I have to mention this because once again, in the context of this medium that we're talking about, I found out that Eddie Burt, the trombonist, had uh, home movies that he shot with the band when they were with Benny Goodman. And, you know, that's, that's a rare opportunity Mm -hmm. to witness a time period and an individual and a group dynamic that's available in a medium that is so specific to a period of time, right? He, he shot these regular eight, it wasn't even super eight, it was regular eight home movies. Mm. So 
part of what you see in the film, actually, I, I may even begin with it early on, is a, a reference to a time period that's viscerally and visually available to the viewer in terms of the material aspect of the medium itself. You can tell by the way it's projected, the way it's presented in terms of rhythm and timing, you can place yourself not only historically but materially in that time period and see Wardell's presence in the context of some of the groups that he played with. So mm -hmm. if Benny Goodman wanted him, did Benny Goodman want a bebop player? You know, good. You, to, you know, I don't know. Good point. You know? Good point. <laughs> and, and and if you look at his at his bio, you know, besides spending time with with Earl Hines, he played with Benny Carter, the great you know super giant of the music called The King by Duke Ellington, Benny Carter. Um, yeah, but let uh, me say, can I say one thing about this? Sure. Benny, the King, the King that you just referred to wanted absolutely no dialogue with me about Wardell. He didn't want to talk to me about it. And I put uh, that I put that in the film. You recall that? Yeah, yeah, it's true. Benny Carter silenced me, literally. He's got nothing to say. Now, yeah, might am I going been, to... It, Sorry, Am I go going to eliminate that, you know, from the film? I had to present, you know, the different exchanges that I had with people. So who knows? He played with Be with Benny Carter's band right before he died, right? Yeah. So yep. maybe he didn't want to talk about it. I don't know all the details, you know, but I guess going back again to the construction of the work, it's not just because you're a filmmaker or a writer or whatever that people are going to open their doors for you. Right. And, and, and the activity that you see in a film portrait is not seamless. Mm -hmm. You know, we construct the work, it's manufactured, it's an artifice, but part of that construction, at least from my point of view, is I think it's necessary to allow the viewer to know that the complexities of the construction. So yes. as an aside, Benny Carter did not want to talk to me about Wardell Gray. Yes. Period. Yes. Period. Yes. <laughs> and yeah, no, good. And you know, life life is complicated. People are complicated. Right. Situations right. are complicated. Yeah. For for jazz fans, people should know that Wardell moved out to Los Angeles and he was a big part of the Central Avenue scene there. Yeah. Played with And Dexter. he was famous for his te his tenor battles with Dexter Gordon. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yep. He, Too bad, you know. Tell me about was Dexter Gordon available at the time? No. No, but yep. his wife was, his former wife, I think, and we had back and forth dialogues about he wasn't available. At least I couldn't, I, I couldn't locate him, but his wife was really interested in what I was doing and wanted to provide me some, you know, information, but Dexter was not available to me at the time. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. And if people, if but, people want to hear some of those battles, simulations of them, there's an album called The Chase. The Chase, uh, that's right. Yeah. Beautiful album, beautiful. He also played out there, this should be noted, because one of the most powerful exchanges that I had in the film was with Teddy Edwards. Mm -hmm. You know, Teddy Edwards really was, was amazing in terms of his interactions with me, and Teddy Edwards really profiled, among other people, you know, the, the context of the time and the inherent racism that Wardell and other musicians experienced in their life and in their work. So Teddy Edwards was a person that Wardell played with all the time. They practiced together. They played together. And Teddy was really amazing. I mean, he, you know, I keep, I keep talking about this receptivity as a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it, this is not like inconsequential, but, you know, I, in, in retrospect now, I'm thinking now that nobody except Jerry Gray, one of Wardell's wives, nobody ever said to me that they wanted money, compensation, to talk to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I bring this up because I've been working on another project for a number of years, and I tried to speak to one of the, the musicians and, you know, they have agents and the figure that they threw out at me of what they wanted just for me to speak to them was mm. incredible. So nobody, right, in, in, in this entire enterprise, 
except with Jerry. And there's a wonderful humorous exchange that I had with her about economics. So here's mm-hmm. another thing, the economic, the economics, the reality of making a work, right? I wanted to include that also. I didn't want that to be sort of, sort of, a, you know, an unsaid, but nobody mm-hmm. asked me, listen, I'll talk to you if you give me this amount of money. Yeah. Right. So, which is yeah. much appreciated because I'm a one person show. Right. You know, right. I'm, and I'm glad you mentioned that early in the call. I didn't realize, I mean, you loved, and, and for young people, you guys cannot imagine what it used to be like. <laughs> tell them, tell them. I mean, you, you know, couldn't just tell push, them what it was. Tell them. Well, you, well, for one thing, you couldn't just push a button and capture footage. You had to lug uh, film around. You had, you I had lugged, to hand yes, feed I, the camera with the film. You had to take the film right. out. You that was the light the, part. Ken, that was the light part. The film was the light part. <laughs> the oh, and then the, <laughs> right. It's and okay. I'm glad I had the energy to do it. You know, I'm not bemoaning it at all, but it was a different kind of enterprise. Let's put it this way. I mean, I use my iPhone now, you know, and, and other digital realms. Realms. It's it's okay, but it was it was a different way of working, and you just had to have a physical strength, <laughs> literally. Yeah. <laughs> to do it. So, you know, and I you, was able to do it. God bless me, you know. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, there was, I can't no do it now. A, a fr- there was no such thing as a frail cameraman or, or documentary no. filmmaker. You no. couldn't be one. You had to be no. strong. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing, and, you know, because, yeah. I'm, uh, yeah. And, and you have to plan. You have to plan a lot more. Yeah. You, have to, you have to think through things a lot more carefully. It's the That's difference right. between... There's a difference between writing a letter to somebody by hand. Well, it's sort of like the difference between writing a letter by hand to someone and sending an email. There's just a lot more pieces involved. in You have to get the stamp, the envelope. I wouldn't take it back. I wouldn't take it back. I'm just saying, you know, for contemporary viewers or listeners, in your case, the context of the times and the materials are worth noting in terms of how the artifact was constructed. Absolutely. And, And I'm, I'm, I don't, I can't articulate why, but I'm glad it was made this way. I was, I'm glad it was made by hand. Filmmaking was handmade. <laughs> it's very different than, than video. You, you had Let your hands say, on the film. What's that? Well, you know, I don't want to dismiss the contemporary mediums. I participate in them. It's just, it's just, it's very different and it has a different presence and people, it's not either or people integrate both both ways of working these days. I will say this, however, since you brought it up with me and prior to us going on the air, there is one particular segment in the film. It's a 13 minute interlude where I played a lullaby and rhythm track with Wardell and Charlie Parker and other people. And my intent because I thought of this as a projected experience, projected meaning a film projection experience, that there would be shifting gradations of color throughout this 13-minute interlude. In the process of transferring the film, the 16-millimeter film, to the, digi- to the video technologies at that time, and now you know digital technologies like DVD, those gradations of color have shifted tremendously. Mm. So my intent is no longer there. So oh. I appreciate it when you mentioned that, that you yourself like that component of the film, but my intent that was specific to a medium is no longer the same visually. Oh, right? okay. In the transfer process, when you transfer from film, at that time it was to three-quarter to beta, which right. was high-end system and then from beta to whatever the video technology was at the time vhs and then to dvd a lot is lost at least okay. in the transfer right just oh. in that comp- just in that particular component the other the other parts is okay the transfer is okay because it was all shot mostly in black and white gotcha i yeah. will someday i don't know if you if keep me on your mailing list if you ever screen yeah. this i'd love to see what it looked like on film uh-huh. because it's it's one of the – for me, it was the climax of the film, interestingly enough. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that segment? That, that segment? Yeah, it's just how I experienced it. I, and so for, for people who are going to get the film, and, I, and really if, you, if you're interested in jazz, you, you really ha- you need this. 
you, you get this Where were feeling. you, Ken, when the film first came out? I needed you to promote this 25 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? But it is. It's, it's, a, it's a treasure. And so you're watching the film, and, and you're getting a sense of, of this man and his life and the people that knew him and the people that loved him and his career, and you're getting mm-hmm. glimpses. And the music. Of, Don't forget the music. Don't of forget course. the music. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. You're yeah. getting you're getting glimpses of his music and it's all good. And then there's to me this peak experience of Wardell with Charlie Parker. Now that was a live recording somewhere? Yes. Can you tell yes. a little I got it. You, tell I me a little bit about which that. record. I forget which record I got it from. I you know, oh, okay. I forget. I, it was just a search so I'm editing this. Right. And I really wanted that when I use the word interlude, I need I wanted some kind of break between what has transpired for, let's say, an hour so far. Right. I wanted mm-hmm. some kind of break. But more importantly, I really wanted the viewer listener to get a sense of Wardell's playing, not just these mini clips. Right. I want right. the full extent. And I love that lullaby rhythm piece with Charlie Parker. And I said to myself, okay, Abraham, you're going to put this in now with what you have in mind. And I knew at that time that that would really, really limit where this work is going to be shown. I knew it. Mm -hmm. I knew it. But listen, I have a day job. I've always had a day job, you know, and I like my work. I mean, as an educator, so I I don't rely on my work for my income. So I made a decision at that time based on what I was interested in formally, cinematically, Mm -hmm. and knowing full well of the sacrifice that that would be in terms of the public sphere to show – 13-minute musical interlude with shifting the gradations of color in terms of people's attention. Even yep. back then, even back then, when I say back then, pre, you know, digital world of smartphone media and distractions and things like that, right? So I just made a formal decision. I just, I opted in terms of what I really was interested in cinematically. And maybe that's one of the reasons. I don't know why. I can't predict why. I mean, so the, the film, you know, I showed the film in different places. It's had circulation, but limited. Let's put it this way, limited circulation. Gotcha. But gotcha. I, so, I'm delighted. I'm really delighted, Ken, that you like that segment. I mean, I really appreciate that you like that. You know, I think I think people that really love music <laughs> are going yeah. to love the effect when it, when it gets to that point. Yeah. Because it's definitely not conventional, yeah. uh, but it's kind of like it's sort of like for that period of you've been on the earth this whole you know up to that point you've you've been on the earth and you're talking with people of the earth yeah. and now suddenly you with Wardell's music and with Charlie Parker play, they're, they're playing together you leave Earth's gravitational pull you're in another yeah. sphere and it's yeah. it's kind of like a pure experience of the music. Mm. Mm. And very tricky to do that, and you did it. <laughs> well, I did. You know, I mean, I just did it with with consequences. I mean, I must say there are consequences of it. So that's why I'm really I appreciate. It. I'm not just saying because we're on the air. I really appreciate you saying that because it was important to me. You know, I really loved that music. I loved the way they played together, and I wanted that to be part of the film experience. So, you know, I don't know what convention means. I know what you mean by convention, but, you know, conventions shift, you know, True. and they're not, they're not monolithic and people have different experiences with conventions. So I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that. Yeah. That, well, yeah, it was, uh, it was, it really, I was put in a different realm and, and I, as a viewer, it allowed me to immerse myself into the music of Wardell Gray, and I was really yeah. grateful for that. Op- and it was and it's perfect because there, there was this lead up where you're, hey, there was a guy named Wardell, and he did this, and he went there, and this guy knew him, and this person says this about him, and here's a little bit of his music here, and here's a, little, and then finally, okay, let's hear him. And very important point, he is playing with Charlie Parker, yeah, but as an absolute peer, you know, that's they're, right, they're, they're that's peers, right. which that's was, right. yeah. Very eye, very very eye opening, very ear opening. You know, people can talk about his artistry, but when you have him, sometimes you know, compare and contrast. When you put artists together, things 
get revealed. Well, when you mm-hmm. put Wardell Gray with Charlie Parker together, you suddenly realize, wow, Wardell is very formidable and substantial and quite the artist. Hey, I, you know, I think we, we should just mention that we're, he died under very suspicious, tragic circumstances, you know, far too young and heartbreaking to everybody that knew him and everybody that loves music. And the, the circumstances are kind of mysterious. And you covered that very in an interesting way, too. You made the mystery apparent. And also the idea that, well, maybe people, there, are, there are clearly people that do know what happened, but they're not talking, you know. But it's just one of those, one of those cases in many of these stories in jazz. And, and again, it goes back to the nature of the profession. You know, jazz clubs and, and performance venues, especially in those, those days, were not necessarily the most savory yeah. environments. Yeah. In fact, I can tell you, let me tell you this, and, and the listeners too, because this will be fascinating. So I go to Cuba a lot. And I was talking with a musician about, I said, let's open a, cl- a jazz club in, in Havana, you know? Yeah. And she said, we can't. Oh. And I said, what do you mean we can't? She said, because there's a lot of great musicians down there. She says, the government won't allow new music clubs, new live music clubs. And I thought to myself, well, that's crazy. Here we are in like the most musical piece of earth on the earth. And the government won't allow music clubs. And it goes back to their still visceral memory of what it was like when the mob ran Uh all Uh the music venues Uh and they all these years later apparently they're still terrified of losing control to that element not necessarily the you know the american mob but just that underworld element yeah so that should give some people some perspective not only do jazz musicians have to you know master their craft and be you know work hard and and be inventive all the time they also had to be on the road all the time, and they had to also be elbow to elbow with some of the most sleaziest uh-huh. characters on earth uh-huh. just to do business, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? Yep, yep. So this, and, and it, it is possible that you know Wardell was a victim of of that particular phenomenon. It could be, and you know, I really, you know, I tried to present whatever information I had and that was available to me, and what people said and reflected on it, but I really didn't want to harp on it so to speak you know yes. i didn't want to you know i just yeah yeah well you know someone's death is part of the story of their life so it, it had to yes. be in the narrative but yeah. no i thought you, i thought you handled it beautifully i thought you know you. It, it it had the weight that it required but it wasn't you know you, you weren't harping on it no uh, no yeah. i didn't i it didn't want well, to do that I it was well handled hey abraham how can people get this film well as I mentioned to you earlier, there's a place in New York City called the Jazz Record Center on the west side. They seem to continue to have copies, or they can contact me. I mean, I'm a self-distributor of it, of the DVD. People are still contacting me about it occasionally. So I think, I don't know, should I give my email or what? Yeah, if, what? if you wouldn't mind, that would be great. You mean I should do it now over the air? Yes. So just... Yeah, if you, if you don't mind, and then I'll also put it on the page too, but just so people hear it once. Yeah. A Ravette at Hampshire.edu. That's A and then R A V E T T at Hampshire, H A M P S H I R E dot E D U. Great, and we'll also put Thank that on. Thank you so on. much, uh, Ken. It's really, like I said, I wish you would have had this. You, you guys weren't <laughs> around 25 years ago. Right? I mean, <laughs> there was, I, I was around, but Jazz on the Tube wasn't around because there yeah, were only about 10 websites of, yeah. on, the, on the Internet when you made this That's film, right. literally. Yeah. Yeah, the, don't forget, guys, the web was only, I mean, the web browser was only developed, Mosaic was only developed in 1993. So ah, there, ah. there wasn't a lot of Internet action uh-huh. in those okay. days. Yeah. Hey, I'm going to just throw a thought out to you. Do you know that there's an Oklahoma Jazz Hall of Fame? Are you aware of those folks? I wasn't aware of that place, no. Yeah. Okay. Well, given that Wardell was born in Oklahoma, oh. they might be really interested in this film. They should. So what's it called, the, the Oklahoma? Yeah, it, it, the Oklahoma, it's the Oklahoma, let me look it up right now. It's, I think it's the Oklahoma Jazz Hall of Fame. Okay. Yeah, Oklahoma Jazz Hall of Fame. 
And people, you know, especially us Easterners, Northeasterners, we, we're probably thinking, what? Oklahoma, Jazz Hall of Fame? Yeah. No, Oklahoma produced a ton <laughs> of great musicians, and Wardell is, is one of them. And they may be very, very interested in, sure. in, in this I'll, film. I'll get in touch. I'll get in touch with them. They should have a copy. I'll definitely yeah. get in touch with them. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. And, if any, and we also have a lot of people who are, are directors or, or active members of jazz societies around the country. If somebody, you know, made it possible, you know, because obviously there's expense involved, could this ever be screened in its film state again? Do you, you still know, have there's, copy? So here, here's something you might be interested in and your listeners as well. The film is more than two hours long, right? Mm -hmm. And in order to make a print a 16 millimeter print, the first print, which is called an answer print. Usually people make prints and they look at it and they decide if it's good for color or for exposure. And then they make more prints and each time it's less money. But the answer print, I made one print of the film. It was two hours, more than two hours long. The, the print at that time cost me more than $3,000. Wow. Right? Just, so I only had one print of the film. I mean, the, the, I have the original negative, but I never made more than one print. And the print now is being archived at a place in Los Angeles. The Academy Film Archives is archiving that print. So they actually, it, it's not them. Wait a minute. It's the Pacific Film Archives that has the 16 millimeter print of Forgotten Tenor. They have an archive there. This is the University of California at Berkeley. They have the print. So I, they never restricted necessarily on its screening, but would have to go through them. And I think the DVD is okay. You know, Ken, I, I think oh, yeah. as much as I would, every time you project the film, you, you potentially scratch it even more. Yeah. And I think it's just too costly at that length to make another print. I don't have that much requirements for it, but I think the DVD is workable. Absolutely. People, people, yeah, people get it, you know, from that as well. And I'm willing to kind of like bite my tongue on that <laughs> interlude. No, seriously, I, I, I have to do that because that's just the way it is, the transfer from one medium to another. And sometimes I might say something to people about it before the screening. There was a local screening for a group of friends and colleagues here in, in Northampton. And I mentioned that to them. You know, these are all like musicians. They were interested. So I mentioned to them, listen, there's an interlude. Here's what I had in mind. What you're going to see now is not really what I had in mind. And they were fine with it. You know, they could imagine, you know. Well, the, the interesting thing is I didn't, I didn't know what you had in mind. And I experienced yeah. it with the limitations of the transfer and yeah. I was I was digging it. I liked it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well that's good. That's good to hear that. Yeah. Well we've been talking with Abraham Rivette, professor of film and photography at Hampshire College, maker of Forgotten Tenor, a tribute to the great Wardell Gray. And yeah. I hope everybody who listens to this gets it because it's it's a beautiful film about a very important artist and I'm glad I walked. I, my life is richer for having seen it. So, Abraham, thank you so much. And, thank uh, you. Ho hopefully we'll meet someday. I live in Tivoli, New York, which is probably an hour and a half from Hampshire. Where, so where maybe, is that upstate New York? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, yeah. I'm right across the river from Woodstock. And, oh, uh, I see. Okay, yeah. And for, and for jazz people, Sonny Rollins, believe it or not, used to live a mile up the street in Germantown, <laughs> now in Woodstock, but he lived there for decades. So that's, that's mm -hmm. part of the world I'm in. Well, thank you again for, for your interest and for taking the time to speak with me. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. Okay. All right. We hope you enjoyed the podcast. If you did, please share it. That's how we grow. And remember to subscribe to jazzonthetube.com, the Internet's largest collection of free, streamable, classic jazz videos.